Hello and welcome to the Saskatchewan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Caroni, and the current market is one that very much favors sellers. But are you getting the best bang for your buck? Saskatoon realtor Norm Fisher joins me this week and talks about the four things that he does as an agent to make sure that home sellers are maximizing their opportunity in the current market. Hope you enjoy. You're listening to the Saskatchewan Real Estate Podcast, where we chat with real estate experts from across the province to learn what's happening in the real estate market. Here's your host, Ron Caroni. So happy to have Norm Fisher joining us today. Norm's a realtor in Saskatoon. He's no stranger to the ebbs and flows of the market. And I can't wait to dig a little deeper on how homeowners may be able to use this opportunity to their advantage. So first of all, welcome to the show, Norm. Thank you, Ronald. It's nice to be here. I appreciate you having me on. So Norm, let's start with your experience and how you got into the real estate industry and just how long you've been here. Sure, sure. I uh, was licensed in 1993, so I'm approaching the end of my third decade in the business. It was really uh, one of my first serious full-time gigs. I I did uh, sell furniture kind of right out of high school for a couple of years. And then I had about five years of radio broadcast sales before I I jumped into real estate. Um, My father was a a realtor and uh, a bit of a pioneer in the Saskatoon real estate space. He was one of the first guys to have a customer courtesy van and uh, and a team. Uh, He you know, he he was there at the very beginning of that team concept. And uh, basically, I was recruited onto his team. He, uh, I was experiencing some frustrations in my, my work, most of it around micromanagement and that kind of thing. And uh, Bill convinced me that real estate would be a good opportunity for me to uh, experience being more self-employed, but, uh, you know, have a, have a lot of potential for growth over the future. Does your personality suit that well, that you like the flexibility of being self-employed as a realtor? You tend to make your own hours and your customer journey is what you make it? Yeah, I I think so. Um, You know, at the beginning, it was quite difficult uh, to to just learn how to to manage my activities. and and progress uh it, you know this this is a line of work that could be easy just to fall into a dark lonely space <laughs> waiting for the telephone to ring but you know you, it, it's a sales business and you have to uh be willing to get out and connect with people and ask for business um so you know if 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 a person has that in them um you know there's lots of opportunity here for sure what systems did you implement? You kind of talked about you had to, you know, move on from that. What did you do in those early stages to kind of get you set up for that? Well, you know, it, it um, m- most of our systems are, are beautiful in their simplicity, really. You know, like you, you know all of the steps that you go through when you have an accepted offer for a buyer and all of the steps that you go through when you have an accepted offer for a seller or when you take a new listing. So it's a matter of, you know, reducing those things to paper uh, to start with um, and and then, you know, having them in some kind of a system so that, you know, there's no failures along the way. Um, And, you know, we, we have systems like that for each area of our business that require some uh, ongoing maintenance some, and, and involvement right. from a human. Yeah. And, now we, and now we need a system for that really hot real estate market. And so right. quickly touch on, uh, and I, I actually watched a Zoom of you over the weekend and you went into some fantastic detail about it. If you could just quickly condense it, what is the market supply in Saskatoon specifically right now and how does it compare to where it should be? All right. Uh, We have a supply of about 490 single family homes right now. To put that in some kind of perspective, that's down about 350 units from where we were a year ago. And that number has been falling uh, since 2015. So uh, each each year we've been seeing a decline to the single family home inventory. Uh, Most of that, in my view, is uh, related to slowing housing starts. So, you know, in in 2014, just before the price of Canadian oil took a massive dive, um, builders were heavily invested in this market. And I think 
in 2014, there were literally 3,500 multifamily units that were under construction uh, and many single family homes as well. And then in 15, uh, the market took a, a quick turn and we saw four years of declining unit sales and four years of declining housing starts. So housing starts fell from a high of, of uh, about 3,500 in 2014, all the way down to close to a thousand last year. So, you know, part of this is, is buyers being uh, uh, careful. You know, they got caught big in 2015 with a ton of inventory that was difficult to sell. And I think many of them, uh, you know, probably lost money over the next few years. And now they're, they're a little bit gun shy and uh, really proceeding with caution. So um, you know, most of the, the builders have a plan to kind of, you know, maybe have half a dozen on the go. And as they accept an offer on one, they start another one. But, uh, you know, it's a very conservative uh, approach to, you know, to reduce risk. So housing is one of those things that you can't just snap your fingers and boom, a house is there. Is it hard now in this stage where we do have that low supply? Uh, are, are there enough starts happening right now that will eventually kind of come out of this? Or what's the timeline that we return to normal supply? Well, I think uh, I, I think that the timeline is probably more related to COVID than we might like, like to admit. I, I think that there's probably that that the um, the, the, the risk tolerance for build builders right now is low because of where they've been over the past few years. And there's probably some fear uh, about, you know, the future of the market and, and where that could go, depending on what happens with COVID. So I think, you know, the builders that I'm working with, they, tend, they continue to be uh, very careful about their, their inventory position. Well, and things can change so quickly in this market. We saw it, you know, just in one year, we're kind of at the anniversary of COVID here, that things can rapidly change and it, it can make a big difference for those people who are trying to manage their supplies and what's going out on the market. For, for sure. Yeah. Um, it, and, and, you know, it's a, it's a complicated beast, really, right? It involves a lot of people and trades and, uh, you know, uh, buying land and, you know, it, it's... Uh, I, I can understand why builders are being very cautious right now, especially given where they've been over the last few years. Right. So as a realtor, we're in this super hot market. And I, I watched Zoom on the weekend where you kind of touched on this and I really enjoyed it, which is why I asked you to come on. We were talking about the, the four things that you as a realtor will focus on for the seller so they can have the best outcome. Can you talk right. about that, Norm? Yeah, for sure. I, I think, um, uh, first of all, a lot of sellers and agents lose sight of the things that really are firmly within our control. Um, and and in, in my view and in my experience over the years, when you're marketing a property for sale, you basically have four bullets that you can use to, to move forward. Number one, it's the amount of preparation that a, a home seller is, is prepared to put into marketing their home for sale. So, you know, the basic stuff like uh, decluttering, depersonalizing, deep cleaning, um, and deferred maintenance. These are the little things around your house that you, you're thinking, oh, I got to get to that one of these days, but you never seem to. Uh, these things are really important and they're the easiest things for a seller to discount in a hot market because they know that their house is very likely to sell in a short period of time. And that's certainly true, but it's not going to necessarily sell at the best price in a short period of time if you don't take the time to properly prepare it for sale. Uh, buyers are still going into properties and if they're seeing a lot of work to be done, they're uh, either totally disinterested because they have busy lives as well, or they're lowballing on the price because of it. So, you know, it's, it's not a complete cakewalk. If you take the time to prepare your house for sale, you should have a good experience. The second item, sorry. Let's quickly cut in there, Norm. When you're talking about um, the, uh, the part of deferred maintenance, where does a person draw the line between fixing something and not fix, fixing something and perhaps leaving it for the, the new buyer to take that. Is there a guideline? You know, uh, start with anything that's broken. If it's broken, it should be fixed, right? Nobody is going to pay you 
for the problems that exist there right now. The seller is going to pay for those problems one way or the other. And it's a lot cheaper to look after them before the house goes on the market than to deal with it in an offer. So I would start there. Anything that's not functioning properly uh, or that's obsolete uh, should, should be replaced. Other, you know, simple fixes above and beyond those items would be paint, right? Cheap, easy. In fact, most sellers can do it themselves if they're prepared to take the time to, to do it well. Um, and flooring is also something that can be a, a reasonably inexpensive improvement that can really improve your odds of selling at a good price. Um, major renovations, usually not. Uh, unless the whole house is a major renovation zone, and then you can look at it as a flip almost for yourself, right? Okay, my house is worth this because it's, you know, it needs a complete overhaul and I can bring it to this if I'm willing to spend this. Uh who should a person talk to about that norm? Should they chat with their realtor, perhaps a contractor about the post value of renovation uh, versus what you might just be able to get from it. Who's the best person to touch base with that on? Yeah. Yeah. Those are questions that a realtor should definitely be able to answer. So, you know, when we're, uh, when, when we're preparing a new listing for the market, you know, that's one of the services that we offer is an initial walkthrough where I'm pointing out things saying this should be addressed. This should be addressed. This should be addressed. Um, and, and if I see large, improvements that can be made to deliver a good return, uh, I'll bring that up as well. But the objective really is to, uh, you know, not put the seller to unnecessary work, but only have them spend money on things that, that they can get a fair return for on resale. Right. So maybe that shag carpet could be replaced by something right. a more modern, but depending yeah. on what you're kind of getting for your bang for your buck, you'll make that decision, uh, you know, as the client with your realtor's advice. Exactly. Flooring is sort of either really dated or really beat up uh, that that warrants considering uh, an investment in that. And those, you know, paint and flooring can uh, move a property way forward in terms of its overall visual appeal to to buyers. Fantastic. On to the next point. What do we have? Yeah. So so the next, you know, you've uh, you've taken the time to uh, polish this home up and make it look its best. Uh, the worst thing that can go wrong right now is some uh, amateur hack comes in with an iPhone to photograph it, right? Uh, the, the first viewing for your home always happens online these days. Nobody crosses the threshold until they've scrutinized it on the internet. So uh, point number two is presentation. How do we make this home look its best online so that when buyers see it, there's an emotional reaction and uh, you know, that causes them to reach out to a real estate agent for a showing. So, you know, uh, staging is a, is a great way to go. Uh, and everybody can benefit from that to some extent. So again, step two in our process is a full staging report. We've got through the fixes. Now we involve a decorator and that person says, do this, do that, move this, get rid of this stuff, so on and so forth. Right. Trying to create a bit more of a show homey feel than professional photos. Uh, maybe a good multimedia tour so that people can walk the house on the outside and a good understanding between you and your realtor of what you have for sale here. So nobody knows the home better than you do. Don't be afraid to tell your real estate agent what features you think should be highlighted for, uh, the, you know, so that buyers understand what it is that's for sale here. Right. And you also mentioned uh, during your presentation that virtual tours are becoming much more popular, especially in a time where you can't get into the house. Can you touch right. on that and kind of how that's growing in the real estate industry? Yeah. I, I, the statistics that I read from the Canadian Real Estate Association suggested that requests from buyers for multimedia virtual tours were up uh, 500%. And the statistics from the listing database suggests that uh, buyers are 43% more likely to reach out and inquire on a home that has a multimedia tour. But what we're finding right now, again, with this hot market, um, this is a service that real estate agents uh, might feel okay dropping from their list of services because it's a $400 service and they're, they're 
re, uh, reasoning is, well, you know, I'll probably sell this house this week. So do I really need to spend that money? And I would say as a seller, hold your realtor accountable to, you know, the same approaches in marketing as they might take if it was a slow market. Yes, that's important. And we've seen the number of tours on our system fall significantly lower at the same time as the demand is increasing. Norm, have you seen folks who will buy a house sight unseen uh, in this kind of time? There, there are stories, but they're few and far between. I sold a, a home to some folks who uh, moved to Canada from New Mexico uh, late last year, sight unseen. It was a new home, which it was from a reputable, reputable builder. So it was a fairly easy decision to make. I think that there probably are more um, virtual showings going on where the realtor goes out and maybe FaceTimes with the client, but very few people are willing to make that, uh, you know, half million dollar decision without putting their uh, feet inside the place. Right. So we're not quite at the stage of full virtual, but there might be some slow steps towards a tiny more portion of that. Yeah. Yeah. And the virtual tour is a great qualifying tool just to, um, you know, reduce the number of show, uh, sort of nuisance showings, I'll say, right? So a client comes out and it's not for them. They, they might be able to determine that by the virtual tour. And right now, um, you know, if, if you've got a house in the 250 to 450 range, I can probably line up a showing every half hour today, all day through the end of the day. And if, if, if you can uh, reduce some of those nuisance showings, you have more room to get real qualified buyers in who might, uh, who might be interested in making an offer on that home. Fantastic. Moving on yeah. to point number three. Yeah. The, the third uh, thing that I would say is more important than ever is promotion. And again, uh, your real estate agent isn't going to have any trouble getting showings, but uh, are we reaching the right people uh, with the right message enough times? So, uh, you know, our approach today is as robust as it ever was, except now we're doing more promotion prior to putting the property actually on the market. Uh, things can turn so quickly and we don't want our client to lose the advantage of a little bit of time on the market uh, for that exposure. So if we can start promoting a, a, a home a week before it goes on the market, you know, we have some realtor networks that we can promote in. We can do um, uh, retargeting people who have visited our website over the past uh period of time and build some interest prior to the house actually even coming on the MLS, um, you, you're going to be much more likely to meet that buyer that'll pay the highest price. And Ron, going through uh, 2007, as I did, that was a period of time where listing inventory was extremely low. Prices were rising at a rapid rate. And, you know, you could collect 10 to 20 to sometimes 30 offers on a home. And literally, like the difference between the low offer and the high offer could be tens of thousands of dollars apart. So you don't want to miss out on that one buyer who's maybe most motivated for that particular property, right? Their daycare is down the street or they work not too far. And, and for that reason, this property really clicks for them and they'll step up and pay for it. We don't want to miss that, uh, that buyer. Everyone's kind of got a story on that side of why maybe that house makes sense for them. Maybe mom and dad are next door, or maybe there's that school that they really want the kids right. to do. So you know, when you say uh, buyers touching back to your site, you'll remarket to them. Is there a reason why those clients might, or those buyers, pardon me, would be a little more advantageous than someone who is fresh? Well, only, only that they've shown some interest in, in real estate in the recent past, right? Enough so that they showed up at our website to look. Yeah. Um, fair, fair housing rules with Facebook and online ad networks have uh, really whittled down the amount of targeting that you can do, but you can you can definitely uh, reach people who have, have been to your website before and shown some interest in property. Great. And that's kind of a metric that you can use to help you and the client along that journey. Right. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number four, what do we have? Yeah, the, the fourth item is your price, right? Uh, and and uh, I see, I see um, preparation, 
presentation and promotion as the foundational issues that your price sits on top of, right? If the things along the bottom are firm and well executed and done, then price becomes the only real lever that you can pull to affect a faster sale if your house isn't selling. Um, when it comes to price, you know, your the, the places to look obviously are recent sales, uh, although you got to take some care because we are in a bit of an upward curve right now. So you, when you're looking at recent sales, you want to be aware of that, right? That prices may have risen since those homes sold. Active listings um, and, and then feedback from buyers that are coming through. You know, you got a house that's in that kind of sweet spot and it's shown 25 times over the first three days that it's for sale and it hasn't attracted an offer something's wrong in one of those four quadrants probably either your your preparation presentation or your your price so those are those are the areas you can look you'd pulled up a great graph uh during the the presentation that you made on the weekend and it showed the timeline of the house and how valuable the time was at the very beginning can you quick right. talk about that norm yeah, if you get an offer on your property in the first week, it's highly likely to sell at or above list price. Once you get beyond that period, it starts to decline and it gets worse as time goes on, right? Which is funny because sellers will say to you, hey, I've got lots of time. I'm not under any pressure. But time doesn't necessarily work on your uh, in your favor, right? It's like a suit that's on the rack. Um, next year instead of this year, right? It's far less attractive, um, if, if nothing else, because nobody bought it, right? And the human psychology is, hey, this is not a very attractive piece of merchandise because no one's bought it. So, um, you know, you want to be mindful of that. Your, your best opportunity is in the first 30 days to get the best price for your property. After that, it's, it's kind of declining. And it seems it might be a bit counterintuitive that the more people who could see it, perhaps over a 30 day period, uh, it might benefit them. But I also know that you have a tactic to deal with that as well. You talked about kind of a, I, I might miss the, the exact wording here, but a soft open for the house. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's th th that, that would be the final point that I would add in in this type of market, a seller's market, right? Like my biggest concern for my client, my selling client, is that. Uh, something happens too quickly. Uh, and I think the example that I gave in my promotional video for that webinar is, hey, I call on a new listing at 3.30 that just came on the market at 10 a.m. today, and I'm told that an offer has already been accepted. It's five and a half hours has gone by from the time it came on till a deal. Um, you know, how many people could have actually been through that house and how many great prospects for that property are still at work? They couldn't possibly see the house because they can't get away, right? So setting up a strategy that is going to give you at least a couple of days to explore the market for that, that perfect buyer. If the promotional plan is aggressive, there's a high likelihood that the best buyers, the most motivated buyers, they're there, they're waiting, they're watching, they're paying attention, they're going to get out there in, you know, in, in, in a hurry. Um, but you can only get so many people through your house in one day. So, you know, strategies that we're using right now might be like a, a soft launch where we're doing a bit of promotion and, and uh, marketing it exclusively initially, and then going to the MLS quickly when we get an offer, doing just some, putting it on, uh, doing some pre-promotion, then putting it on the, the MLS and insisting on a period of time for presentation of offers where, you know, seller, uh, asks 24 or 48 hours for offers. The third one uh, is, is an actual delayed presentation of offers where, you know, you list the home on Thursday and you, uh, you, you have your client sign a direction not to present any offers to them until uh, a certain date and time. And, and, you know, those are all different approaches and highly dependent on, on circumstances of the seller and the property itself. And this kind of goes full circle to what you were talking about of building systems and having different levers that you can pull and different things that you right. can pull depending on what market you're sitting in. Yeah, exactly. If your real estate agent does not have a strategy uh, 
for you know how offers are going to be managed, you might be dealing with the wrong real estate agent. That's that's really critical right now. And I don't say that to be critical of competition, but the bottom line, Ronald, is that most of the real estate agents working in this market right now haven't experienced a seller's market ever, right? And may have never experienced a multiple offer situation. So, um, you know, they they can just get excited. <laughs> And, hey, we got an offer and it's only open till five. We got to deal with this, right? Um, you you got to manage that as the listing agent and, and the seller. And, and to make sure that you don't lose control. And perhaps that offer is above what you listed it as. And you might think that that makes everyone happy. But, you know, I think you were talking uh, in the presentation that $10,000 more that you could have gotten is a big deal to someone who is selling their house tax-free. Oh, for sure. As a primary resident uh, of that home in Canada, your your gains are tax-free. So $10,000, you probably have to make $15,000 at work uh, to, you know, to, to net $10,000. It's a lot of money. It's a couple years uh, college tuition for, for your kid, right? Or uh, whatever, a nice family vacation. So, yeah. Uh, negotiating on that point becomes so much more important when you're framing it on that side and, and being a realtor, you probably can deal with the more personal side of, of the home buyer and kind of going through their situation. And it does become important to take care of them through that process. Yeah, a- absolutely. Buyers are definitely depending on us to give them good advice. Um, you know, the, the thing for buyers to keep in mind right now is that there is a bit of an upward curve. There's enough upward pressure on prices that it's kind of obvious. You can see it happening, right? Uh, if, if that continues over the next 90 days, logic would tell us that this house is going to be worth more in 90 days. And it might be, uh, it might be a smart strategy for a buyer to stretch just a little bit more right now uh, to avoid having to buy up here, right? Fantastic. Really great information. And now we're going to quickly pivot. Uh, We're going to ask you a question about uh, yourself. If you could go back to young Norm Fisher, he's just entered in uh, the real estate business. Maybe it was still when you were uh, selling furniture, but what advice would you go back and give yourself at that time? Oh boy. Um, I think Honestly, Ronald, my advice would be probably more personal related. It would be like, enjoy the journey more along the way. Uh, remember that life is not all about work. You got to stop and play. And in fact, in recent years, I've become a firm believer that taking time to play uh, fuels you for work as well. If you're, if you're looking after yourself in that way, you're likely to show up uh, in, a, in a better, stronger way for your, your clients as well recharging the batteries, if you will. It, it, exactly. Yeah. Avoiding burnout. Right. And this is an easy business to fall into that, uh, where you can just sort of suddenly find yourself, uh, right. Oh, it's another client, God. <laughs> and that's not a good place to be in. Excellent. Norm, if people want to get more information about you, they want to contact you, perhaps they have an interest in having you listing their home, where can they find your information? What contact details can you give us? Sure. Teamfisher.com, uh, one of the, the more mature real estate websites in the market or Google Norm Fisher. I'm easy to find on, on social media as well. And I'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Norm, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Really appreciate your insights and your information. It was a blast and I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been my pleasure, Ron. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Norm Fisher for coming on the program today. If anyone has any questions about home sales or how to get ready as a buyer, please reach out. I can help you answer any questions you have about the pre-approval process. If you enjoyed this episode with Norm, hit the like and subscribe button. And don't forget, if you have any home sellers in your life, share this episode with them. Enjoy the rest of your week. This has been the Saskatchewan Real Estate Podcast. If you like this episode, find more information and episodes on our Facebook and YouTube pages. If you'd like to be a guest or have a conversation you'd like to learn more about, let us know by messaging the show on Facebook. Thanks for listening.